Okay. I want to talk tonight about Jewishness and Judaism. Okay. The first thing to understand is that these are big descriptive terms which cover beliefs, feelings, actions, attitudes, orientation, and so forth. So the first point is to realize that we're dealing with a very, very complex conglomeration of factors. But in order to do some kind of analysis, we have to get at least a minimal definition to begin with as a tentative thing. Later I'll come back to how we can improve the actual finding of what we're going to talk about, of what is this. Okay, Judaism. Judaism is a religion. We don't have to spell it out in detail. Any person who is giving, uh, having a way of life that's built on the halacha, however it's understood, is in the domain of Judaism. So, it could be that the full array of factions of conservative, what used to be conservative, reform, and orthodox, are within the umbrella of Judaism, even though they have significant differences. Because, as you'll see when we talk about it, there are overlaps. These are not two definitions that don't overlap. There are overlaps on both aspects. Somebody can be committed to Judaism, the religion, but has overlaps that are coming from Jewishness, as we'll define it right away. And somebody can be Jewishness, exemplifying, and have overlaps that are coming in from the, from the religion per se. I mean, somebody could say, look, uh, I eat treif, but I observe the holidays. Now, we would say, well, well, how does that fit? Yeah, but there's so many variations in, in each piece, so we can begin to explore. Why is that? Oh, well, that has something to do with my childhood, because when I was childhood, I had a bubby, and I, you know, a grand, and this was so, I loved the few food so much that it became part of me, and it, later I found it's kosher, and I, when I go out, I always eat kosher. But I don't keep the Shabbat, I don't do this, I don't do that. In other words, all of these are variations inside the definitions. So Judaism has something to do with at least following the inactions, following the halakha, having, uh, if you're amiss or if something passes you, that you do something wrong, it, you in, somehow internalize it as an avera. As a, as a sin. Not a wrongdoing, but a, a wrongdoing with a dimension of either reward and punishment, or that Hashem is looking, or whatever the point is. But there's a, uh, a package. And that's within the frame of Judaism. Now Jewishness is something which comes without a prominence or an entry of any of these kinds of features that come in from Judaism, the religion. And for the moment we leave God out of the picture. So I put in here, Judaism has a number of three or four salient characteristics. We don't have to talk about that. We're all in that framework. Jewishness has five general associations. There is being an independent thinker. The idea that one thinks for themselves and doesn't like any kind of authority, wherever it comes from, especially coming from the religion, one says, look, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do it for myself. Now, of course, sometimes you have to be told what to do first so that you can grow into doing it for yourself. However, there is this characteristic in the literature and there is a big literature on Jewishness and Judaism because it relates to where we are and how we are our, our, our lives and, this, and the continuation of Judaism or Jewishness. It, it, it's, it's a big, a big, big topic. Okay, so one characteristic of Jewishness 
is being an independent thinker. Uh, Spinoza, for example, was an independent thinker and he was lauded by people who were in this fold of Jewishness as distinct over against Judaism. Spinoza was a big hero. One of the reasons was because he was an independent thinker. And that's somehow a characteristic of Jewishness as distinct from Judaism. Which, of course, doesn't mean that you don't think even in Judaism. You think, but it has limits in terms of this, what you think, how you think, and having authority. So it's minimal, because nobody thinks without authority. So if you don't take Judaism as your authority, you're taking something else. You're taking secularism, you're taking liberal egalitarianism, you're taking something else. So it's not, again, I'm, I preface everything by indicating we're dealing with intimations, let's put it that way. Not sharply defined definitions, but just five characteristics of Jewishness that are in the literature, if, that if you read the general literature, you'll see it as a theme that repeats. One of it is this idea, being an independent thinker. Uh, having higher than average moral standards. Even today, it's still in the literature indicates that people who have this sense of Jewishness, as I think from Judaism, have themselves and look as a value <coughs> a higher than average moral set of standards. <coughs> Okay, three, there are ranges of activity in favor of socio-political justice. That when it comes to society and societal things, there's an emphasis, a concern, an involvement, different levels of action, of activity, but a, certainly in a, uh, a sensitivity more than the average person, a sensitivity to the socio-political issues and the justice of the time. As you know, in the uh, civil rights movement, for example, in the 60s in the States, many, many liberal Jews who are in this, what we're calling now Jewishness, were pro-civil rights and pro-Negro and all the rest. Because this was underdog mentality, fighting for the underdog was significant as a feature of the, or a characteristic of Jewishness. Uh, four. There's a stubbornness, tenacity, a strong will to survive against persecution. This had carried over from our recent experience in the 20th century, in the Shoah and so forth, but there is this, as, a, as we call it, a value, a certain kind of a, a strength, a certain concern with that, that, that one can overcome all of these difficulties that Jews and Jewish people have gone through. So it has a, it emerges in the literature as, a, as a, one of the top, one of the uh, characteristics of Jewishness. The stubbornness, tenacity, strong will to survive against persecution. And five, there's an above average resentment and resistance to anti-Semitism. So that's very, it goes along with the previous one, that it's disturbing, but anti-Semitism is a, uh, it somehow disturbs much, much more than somebody who is in Judaism and his life is wrapped up in the doing of the mitzvot, reading the, mater the traditional materials and so forth, and living his daily life is filled with things like that. We could check that out by the newspaper articles you read. We, as Torah people, what, what kind of things that you read? What kind of articles catch your eye and uh, are in the media, or what kinds of programs you turn off on the TV or leave on when it comes to these kind of characteristics. So here we have basically five basic characteristics of what we're calling now Jewishness, Jewishness to get started with the analysis. And again, as I said before, there is overlap, but in general, and for the purposes of our talk tonight, this differentiation is sufficient. But again, I stress that there is this overlap which, uh, which makes it much, much more complicated and sets up a number of problems that we'll talk about. Fingerprints in forensics. 
Apparently, I never checked it out. There are no two prints that are the same. The world! You're talking about the world! You're talking about what, uh, 300 billion people or whatever the population is. Well, look, I mean, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable that there are no two fingerprints that are the same. Well, although I, working on a problem of Jewish identity, should be as simple as just saying, well, give you soul, give you a soul print, I was going to say, give you a soul print, you know, and here it is, we got it clean, and we can now go further and develop. Well, it's not like that. In other words, the closeness, you can have a, up to a certain point uh, the same rep repetitive pattern on the thumb, and then all of a sudden there's another another line, another layer, and that's a different person. So conceptually speaking, because of this complexity and this overlap, the problem becomes one of the big problems becomes how do we ascertain the truth of these characteristics? How are they gleaned? When you read the literature, they were gleaned by sociology people, by people who are studying society. And in society, we have generalizations, which are fall into this category. Generalizations about family, generalizations about kinship, different, different topics. And these are done, but they're done with methodology, with a method, a methodology. Question and answer, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Observation, and so the complexity indicates to us that we really have very, very incomplete categories. Okay. Now, in the literature and in the history of Western civilization, there are, among others, three main exemplifications of Jewishness. One is Spinoza, 17th century, mid-17th century, 1660, whatever. One is Freud, and one is Einstein. And it pays, and what I want to do tonight is a little bit of entry into the Jewishness of these. The Spinoza, I'm going to leave on the side for the moment. We will have a talk, hopefully, on what I call the refuta rational refutation of Spinoza. He has bothered Jewish people, he has bothered Judaism people, no end, for 300 years. I mean, and he's still alive and kicking with respect to people whose Judaism, for one reason or another, weakens or is searching for strength and reads or is familiar with Spinoza. Now, I have a refutation of Spinoza. We'll talk about that at a separate time with a separate talk with the basic argument and the basic materials. Tonight, we're just going to touch very briefly on this uh, Spinoza as exemplifying these, these points. So, to give you one example, no, oh, that's the Freud. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Now we come to Freud. In 1938, Freud wrote this book, Moses and Monotheism. And in that book, he argued, he used a psychoanalytic set of concepts to discuss Moses and monotheism, how Moses was the father of monotheism and how it came to be. And it's basically a book that's built on a, it's a construction, or a, shall I say, a rewriting of history, or a construction of history, built on the Freudian analysis. And in that book, Moses was an Egyptian, and he was killed, and then he was resuscitated, and killed again, and so on. And so in the text, he works out this Oedipal analysis of Moses, and he, Moses was an Egyptian, uh, Akhenaten was the king in Egypt that was the monotheistic king for 18 years, and uh, Freud brings him down, and he says that Moses really studied with him, and 
his monotheism developed. This was the whole picture. He became monotheistic. And this was the, 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 the picture. So in that book, that got him into big trouble because the Jewish community, in effect, ostracized them out and said, you can't even look at a book like that. It's a terrible thing because it was against Judaism per se. It was against Judaism. It had the tenets, which, what, what do we get? Moses was born an Egyptian. I mean, that he learned from Egypt is in the text. The Khartoumi Mitzrayim, he learned, he knew, maybe he absorbed Egyptian knowledge, or wisdom, whatever, but, but that was one piece of the story. But to say that he was an Egyptian, well, that, I mean, where did he get that from? What do you, what do you, what, I mean, that's... And, in addition to that, Freud, by virtue of his psychoanalytic studies, saw that religion, and in the beginning all the patients were Jewish patients, Jewish clients, so in the beginning all these patients were Jewish clients, religious to some extent, to whatever, and he saw that religion played a negative role, without all the details, played a negative role in what we can call mental health. One of the big things is that it fostered guilt, like I said before, sin. Sin is this, not the same as wrongdoing. Wrongdoing, you, we all make mistakes and we can then try to correct them. So in Jewishness, there's wrongdoing, of course. That's human being, that's life. We, we, then we, again, we reconstruct. We say, we'll try not to do it again. And we try to learn from past experience and so on and so on and so on. But that's not sin. It's wrongdoing, but it's not sin. I know in personal development, for me, when I graduated out or realized that there has to be some kind of a balance between Jewishness and Judaism, my own, part of that balance led to a freeing up of sin. Wrongdoing? Yes, but no sin. So until today, when it comes to the holidays, it is no sin. The al hate is the wrong words. For me, there's no sin. There's no feeling of, of reward and punishment. There's no sin, avera. There is, or disobey, disobeying. There's being normal. You made mistakes, so you try to correct it. So I know from personal experience how freeing up that was. It was unbelievable. It took away a blanket, you know, that covered sleeping. You couldn't sleep and so on because you were part of your resting <laughs> was not full. That you 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 took the bed, the, the dimensions that what fell under the idea of sin and guilt. And so for Freud, he had so much experience with this that he realized that this is not the case. And we have to uh, take a view of Jewishness which was atheistic. So Freud expressed his atheism and said, look, this is part of my Jewishness. That in the, I'm an in addition to some exemplifying these properties that we just listed, one he says, "Look, I'm a I'm a thinking person, and for me, I realize that I'm Jewish." And he never gave up his Jewishness. He never converted or anything. He kept his Jewishness. He spoke about Jewishness, and he said, "Look, you could be a godless Jew." And the phrase, godless Jew, was applied by himself to himself and by others. That you could be a Jewish person, have Jewishness, express Jewishness in way of life without having the belief in God. So this was the atheistic dimension of Freud that he learned through experience. Okay? So Jewishness after Freud especially, has emerged with a recognition, or shall we say, or less hardness against somebody who 
does all the mitzvot, but doesn't believe in God as the giver of the mitzvot. And ha doesn't have, or there from that, has a much less, a very minimum or not at all uh, entry into his whole psychic makeup of sin. Wrongdoing, but not sin. And indeed, going with that is the exemplification of that first principle, being an original thing, and not being told by the religion what to do. So a person in that framework is much closer, has fewer blocks, shall we say, to being Jewishness in the sense of these properties. There's no pull against. And so a lot of things are coming from inside yourself. Okay, so Freud's conception of Jewishness was a non a non-theistic orientation. I forgot to mention that given the complexity of these two labels of Jewishness and Judaism, one's whole life can be defined very simply as a quest for who you are. In other words, it, we have the two labels, and based on childhood, education, and development, we find ourselves at a certain point saying, I'm Jewish, but, or I'm Jewish, meaning following the religion, but, and so on, so on, so on. You have all of this combination, but over time, experience changes, things happen in life, and at every time in your life, not only for in crisis situations, but one can say that one's whole life is a, is a search for who am I? What, what, what's my identity? What's, am I Jewishness, exemplifying a way of life of Jewishness or a way of life of Judaism? And I know for myself, as a person, 60 years ago, maybe more, I put myself on trial. I took Hilchot uh, Min, Minut and the Rambam. I, went, I took the Hilchot um, Kofer, Kofer Beke. There were five, six categories of people who didn't accept all of the tenets of the religion. And I put myself on trial. And I said, look, I know myself good, good enough, well enough to do that. Of course, I didn't know enough about the halacha, so I never was able to finish a job and say, oh, you do not have this category, you do have this, you're an Epicurus, but you're not a man, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's a halachic analysis, which leads to a conclusion of having this status, or not this status, on you, a strict halachic analysis. But I said, well, wait a minute. None of the things that I read, even without knowledge and sophistication and halacha, none of the things that I read really put me behind the eight ball and said, look, you are out. You're out. So I was struggling with understanding with the basic tenets of the religion. I mentioned once in passing I went into philosophy for the Torah problem of does, do, you, do you need God's existence to be a Torah person, as I was. So I mean, so a person that's struggling with the with the with the ideas and hasn't concluded them and is in the middle and wavering and so forth and uh, and studying for it. Well, is that a condition for making the person a kofer or somebody who denies the principle? He's not denying and he's not affirming, but he's involved in the problem. And then what about the person that studies? and probes, and reads widely, and then really says, look, you know, <laughs> when I look at myself, I have this feeling of Jewishness, in many, many respects, Judaism, but on this one, I balk. And I remember in the early years, uh, 40, 50 years ago, you know, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm a Torah person. That's what I use my language. I'm a Torah person, but I don't believe 
that God can explain or justify anything. So I used to say that. That was me. Anybody who knew, talked to me and everything, they knew that in conversation this would come up and uh, this is him. If you want to talk to him, you want to know something, they, uh, if you're going to talk, you have to realize that he's coming from a place by base of real, realization that God is not explaining anything. You can't explain or justify. So, in effect, it's, he's out of existence. It's not functioning to do anything. Not only is he non-omniscient, he's non-existent, so he, he certainly can't be an explanation or a justification. Okay, later on, more sophisticated, I asked, well, maybe Judaism doesn't say that. Maybe Judaism says, wait a minute, you jump in too fast. We don't deal with that. We deal with God, Torah, Yisrael. And the what we call God, operationally speaking, is not in a mode of theology or proofs for God's existence, but in a mode of action, of activity. And so when you get more sophisticated and you do the Rambam and so on, you see that our great, great Jewish philosophers didn't talk so much about theology, they talked about the exemplification. So it was called attributes, actual attributes, whatever it was. But the point is that there was concern our greats in the medieval period did have God in the picture, but the primary focus of attention was God's name. God's name was his Torah. God's name was the package of mitzvot to live by. And so that was, that was the picture. Even so much so that in the Rambam, who was one of our greatest people in Jewish philosophy, he said, that he's not, a tenet of the religion requires the unity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the unity of God, but not that God is a creator. He said that remains open unless somebody comes and shows the opposite. So he says the essential thing is not creation or creation from nothing. The essential tenet on the God issue was the unity. Now, I mean, that, he got into trouble. I mean, that was a big, big chiddish, a big innovation. But the point is, it, it went together with a realization that Judaism is not God doing everything. When Spinoza made his critique of the Rambam, he called it a theocracy. Whoever used the word, I grew up Jewish, I grew up as a Torah person. I never, who looked at the mitzvah as theocratic? Nobody looks at the mitzvah as theocratic. Unless you stop and you ask, oh, God gave it, God is the sovereign, if you want to use that kind of language. But strictly speaking, the halachic system of the mitzvot take on their own, their own identity, their own characteristic, and we don't talk about, we don't talk about the sovereign. And to say, like Spinoza did in his critique of the Rambam, that Judaism, Judaism, the religion, was a theocracy, a theocratic society. Well, it's even wrong anthropologically. There was no theocracy in Moshe's time and before. There were semi-nomadic uh, tribes that had unity by a, uh, affectan, whatever they call the word in Greek, uh, that they met together in, as elders and they were the leaders of the society. And Moshe Rabbeinu was not a king in the sense of Shlomo HaMelech, David HaMelech, the monarchy period was, yes. You want to say Shlomo HaMelech? That's a theocracy. But in the Chumash world, there's no theocracy. You've never even heard the word. Who, who would even talk that way? The mitzvot take on a unity of their own as a way of life. Chai Bohem, live according to them, and that's it. So, Coming back to the Freud picture, I just inter inter interrupted with the Spinoza point, but the point is that one learned, at least I learned, that one has to look at a much wider perspective of the God issue where the primacy shifts and becomes the primacy on the law and not 
being bothered by who's the sovereign, who's the giver, and so forth. In the philosophy classroom, of course, in the philosophy classroom, that's dominant. And so for me, everybody has different neshama. My neshama had an emphasis on clarity of intellect. And so for me, it was like carrying all, carrying around with you a, a philosophy classroom. But, but for most people, one is immersed in the mitzvot and even talk and conversation in shul and so on and, uh, is not God conversation, it's mitzvot conversation. And, and Sukkot, you're around, you're sitting around the table, everything. So, what are you talking about? You're talking about the S rog, you're talking about love, <laughs> you're talking about where you got your S rog, where the normal conversation. You're not, you, God doesn't enter the picture. That's not, but for me, it's like carrying in a, a kind of a filter, which in a certain respect disturbs the very fulfillment of the mitzvah, the very enjoyment of the mitzvah. Moshe Rabbeinu Dvarim says he's worried that Klai Yisrael will come into Canaan, do the mitzvah, but without simcha. They will do it from obligation, from fear of punishment, and not from enjoyment, not from simcha, not from within themselves. Okay, so, if you're carrying around a philosophy room, in your back pocket, it makes it difficult to achieve the simcha dimension. You're always observing. So when I would come in the shul and so on, you're always, your eye is always on observation, getting more information and material about how people, others, what they do, how they talk about. This guy shuckles like a crazy man and so on and so on. This, I mean, you're, you're looking at things that are filling up where you are, but you're not, in the, or in the process, you're missing certain things that you, you really don't have full immersion in the mitzvah, and therefore you, you're missing something. Okay, now gradually, over time, these things become part of Torah education for the more advanced person, and so things shift away from the God dominance. Unlike Christianity and Catholicism, where we have St. Augustine in the 400s, uh, Christian era, and St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and so on, where the, the Summa Theologica, the summary of theology, Aquinas built on the Rambam, he says the great Jewish philosopher, every 10 pages take the Aquinas book off the shelf, go by random, I clean up. Every ten pages, you'll see, he says, the great Jewish philosopher. And he's referring to Maimonides, who was translated into Latin, and Aquinas read him in the Latin. And so, the, the first section of the book is God's existence, then angels, and so forth and so on. The whole orientation. And the law, the exemplifications, were not the primary. That was there, of course. There's action, there's, there's ways of living. So he called it faith, hope, and charity, what he, what he called theological virtues. Faith was the mind, hope was the feeling dimension of the person, charity was the actional dimension of the person. So he, Aquinas called them theological virtues. And then the, the natural virtues were justice, temperance, courage, so the, the Platonic virtues for cardinal virtues, so they were the natural philosophic virtues, and there was theological virtues, and this was the orient. So there was a practical dimension, of course, but there was still a focus and a dominance on the foundations, the, the, theor the theological foundations. And I remember, till today, I had, when I was at Chicago, University of Chicago, and I had uh, non-Jewish friends, and I had a couple of Catholic friends of mine because I was very big on the Rambam and I was studying medieval Jewish philosophy and there were other people there who were also studying uh, Catholic <laughs> Jewish Catholic philosophy, you know. And I remember till today, uh, one of the guys said, look, Joe, he says, he cry he's crying. He says, you're so lucky you're Jewish. You're so lucky you're Jewish. You don't have to deal 
with the God issues. You don't have to deal with the sovereignty and the whole picture of Aquinas. You, you got the Torah. <laughs> you fulfill the Torah, you get close to God. That's all that's necessary. You don't need anything, all this work that I'm doing, the guy says, to try to make, find myself as a Catholic. Where am I? Who am I? What am I? I mean, he says, he says, he cry, he says, you're so lucky you're Jewish. You don't have a theology. And in practice, we don't have a theology. The mitzvahs become, take God, their own thing. And look at your own experience. And you'll see, going to the base medrash, when the guys are learning halakha and you listen to the conversation, there's no God talk in the conversation. They're immersed in the understanding of the Shaka Batari of the Inyan, and so they're immersed in the mitzvah. Same thing in practice. So, this was the, so I'm only bringing these things in to indicate that Judaism is not so narrowly defined such that it all is resting conceptually on God. That's true, but there are other dimensions which have to come in when you have the picture. Of course, for somebody like me, unfortunately, that back pocket classroom was there all the time and is still there. <laughs> so, so what I said before about it may take a lifetime to find out who you are, for me, today, is still active. Because I had the problem as exemplified by action, by things that happened in the last number of years, especially since I wrote that first book on the proclamation, 35 years. 35 years is a lifetime. You could learn a lot in 35 years. It's not the same me. When I read the manuscript, I said, that's not me. But it was me. I wrote it. It says right there. But I realized that there's a whole other dimension, a whole bigger picture, and so I realized that when Spinoza talks, for example, about a theocracy, well, he's bypassing the essential characteristics of the society. This is not a theocracy. It's not a theocracy. Theocracy, yes, the, the kings, the monarchy period can be more readily called a the theocratic society, where the king has the king, and then there's the king of kings, and the king is subservient. The king Bob is subservient to HaKadosh Baruch Okay. Okay. So, so after Freud, after Freud, we have this uh, realization that Jewishness does not, for Freud, does not require a theistic understanding. So when that theistic understanding just goes with it, goes out, in our language, in my language, the anti-life dimensions of guilt and sin, depression, go out with the, with the elimination of God as the sovereign in the picture. And that's big. As I'm telling you from my own experience, it's a freeing up that's unbelievable. It's, 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 you have to experience it to really realize what it is. But this is what the story was. Okay, so we have this idea. We have this idea of, of Jewishness that can be with a godless person. Okay? Now I want to go further. I want to read you something, two paragraphs from Yerushalmi, who was a historian. He passed away recently. He was a historian at Columbia, an Israeli originally. And he wrote on the nature of history. He wrote two books, one book called Zachar, Memory. We'll talk about that a little bit. And another book on Freud. Unbelievable how he, he, he found it necessary to take the time, among other studies that he did, and Portuguese this and that, and other historical things, there's a long list of publications, a world-renowned historian who made a big hit with his books, and he wrote a book on Freud. Unbelievable. He wrote a book on Freud. And in that book, he says, and develops a dimension that I want to talk about, of Freud's Jewishness. 
We're now exemplifying Jewishness by a focus of attention for a few minutes on Freud. So, in his book, which is 100 pages, this is page 99, it ends on page 100. In the 100, 100, uh, 100 page book, he, of uh, uh, Moses, he has what he calls the last page, a monologue with Freud. Okay? And he says the following. This is what he called the monologue with Freud. To you, Professor Freud, I confess to a thought that I have had, that I have withheld all along because I cannot substantiate it. I have tried to understand your Moses book within its stated framework of the history of religion, of Judaism, and of Jewish identity, without reading it as an allegory of psychoanalysis. What I have done, whether well or not, stands by itself. But I carry within me a pent-up feeling, an intuition, that you yourself implied something more, something that you didn't, that you felt deeply, but would never dare to say. So I will take the risk of saying it. I think in your metamorphosized extension of Judaism, divested of its, of its illusory religious forms, Jewishness, but not Judaism, but retaining its essential monotheistic characteristics, at least as you understood and described them, in short, Yerushalmi says, I think you believed that just as you are a godless Jew, psychoanalysis is a godless Judaism. I think you believe, Freud, that you, as a godless Jew, godless Jew, your psychoanalysis is a godless Judaism. But I don't think you intended us to know this. Absurd. Possible, but Never at all. In other words, in his book on Freud, he's trying now to capture, he's a historian, he's trying to capture a dimension, an element of Freud's Jewishness, which extended beyond the non-theism, the disbelief in God, and extended to something that's radical. And that's why he says it's his intimation, that's his sensitivity over a lifetime. And even though he can't prove it, he feels this deeply about Freud and says that Freud in a look at his own life work and what he discovered as, in my terms, a life system. In other words, psychoanalysis, which dealt with and opened up for inquiry, the nature of the unconscious, is part of the human experience. Everybody has an unconscious. And so Freud opened up this area to inquiry, and eventually, if possible, to scientific inquiry. So Freud looked at psychoanalysis as a set of techniques that was built on a theory, it could be inadequate, and it is inadequate. He a lot of criticism from Freud on. First he had Jung, and then he had Ferenczi, and he had others, Adler, there were other people who had different critiques of dimensions of Freud, but the overall big picture remained. And this is the way that, that uh, Yerushalmi puts it. Absurd, crazy. But Freud, he says, part of his Jewishness was looking at his work as a form or a, a shall we say, a Judaism with, with two big dimensions that came in from Jewishness. The non-theistic position, that he, Spinoza had the same thing. Spinoza denied the personal God. 
and opted for a philosophical God with ethical properties and so forth, but he denied Hashgacha, he denied everything uh, in the area of personal God, reward and religion, reward and punishment, and so on, so on, so on, so on. But Freud, but Spinoza didn't go further. Spinoza, that's okay, that's part of his Jewishness. But Freud said, in addition to that, I have another dimension that this guy you show me latched onto from the point of view of intimation, from the point of view of sniff, from the point of view of music, not from the point of view of substantiation. He tells you, I couldn't substantiate it. Had I been able to substantiate it, I would have written the book. I would have written the book early and I would have included it in the first hundred pages and I would not leave it for the last, for the last page to indicate my, my sensitivity. So he caught something which for me, it's not absurd at all. Because that's exactly where I stand. Freud, without realizing it, back into Judaism that for me has a big dose of Jewishness. In other words, Judaism per se has, is moving and has moved, swaying back and forth between livability and relevance and so forth, goes back and forth, but the general overall movement is less and less relevance, less and less livability. So we, as mitzvot person, become fewer and fewer in terms of the big picture. We're 75%, then it's 85%, 95% of Jews, not all have Jewishness. Some are totally indifferent that they don't have anything like it. However, there are all these Jews well, they don't, they're not in the God framework. Their view of God is related to one question only, namely the creation of the world. That the, this idea, this problem of the creation of the world needing a creator is something that persists in the Hamonam and people even though they stop and they don't go further. They don't talk about God giving the Torah or anything like that. They talk and stop at the creation issue. Now, I, I said in effect, Moshe Rabbeinu's big mistake was that he said the same thing. He said, I'm non-theist in relation to all these things that Freud is, but I'm theist 100% when it comes to creation of the world. In simple language, the world couldn't make itself. It had to have a creator. So I said in the book, first was, the first book was The Secret Silence of Moses, which exploded his concept of God and substituted by a version of Torah and mitzvot that was resting on life, on life energy, I called it, wherever it was. So I exploded that. And the second book was called The Monotheism of Moses. And the guy... You say, well, he just what he's saying, he's non-theist. So how can you write a book? Each book was 299 pages, if I remember. 300 pages. So how can, here's 300 pages, he's, he's non-theist. And here's 300 pages that, he's, that, he, that he has monotheism. Well, monotheism is just theism, monotheism. So I said, well, at that, t- at that time, Slicha, at that time, the idea that the universe just is, without a creator, was out of the realm of thought. There was nobody in the cultures in Babylonia and Canaan and Egypt that had that thought and stream of consciousness. It was outside the realm of thinking and Moshe Rabbeinu said in effect, yes, in my book, in my five books, I need the first line. Bereshit Borel came the Shemayim Baratorans. I need the first line. I don't have to have the rest. Whatever comes after that is irrelevant to me. We don't need that to have a Judaism. And of course, I built it up by showing that Freud, uh, that Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned with the mitzvot and so forth. And then we talked about Ezra and how Ezra, and I built up a whole picture to justify this switch that he had an exception, one exception. Today, that's a mistake. Because we can readily think of the universe as just being there and we, our job is to probe it and understand its laws and its basis, but it's a pseudo-question 
It's a question that that's not in the domain of science. There's no science that requires a creator outside of the universe, that transcends the universe as the maker, like a person make. I make a cup. So the analogy is to normal making. When I make something, <laughs> I'm outside the product. The product stands independent of me, and that's the implicit analogy that everybody has. That the universe is like a cup, like something made, but it's not made by the human being, it's made by God. But the, this whole aspect of making, of creating the universe, is not necessary. It's not essential to the creation. Here it is, here's the creation, and our job is to study it. And indeed, what did Spinoza do? We'll come to it in detail another time, but what Spinoza said in effect was, God is the universe, and the universe is God. In other words, he took away the idea of transcendent, and with it went no creation problem. He doesn't deal with creation of the universe. Because God is everything in the world, in the universe, and everything in the universe is God. So that this is a reciprocal definition which we call immanence. That God is totally immanent in the universe. But there's no creation. There's no other world. There's one level. There's no two levels. God is not, to say it in the world, is not quite. God is the world, for Spinoza. And the world is God. And indeed, Einstein, everybody knows Einstein went for Spinoza. Why? Why did Einstein have all the philosophy? Why did he go for Spinoza? Well, Einstein kept Jewishness, but left over Judaism. And he says explicitly in many, many places, look, I don't believe in providence, I don't believe in Hashgacha, I don't believe that God needs a reward and punishment system, I don't need all of these things, okay? And I believe in God, I believe in Spinoza's God, he says. What's Spinoza's God? Spinoza's God is, like I said, he's synonymous, the definition, that's what God is. No personal God. He says, I don't, I don't buy that. But I do buy Spinoza's God. Why? Because I'm a physicist. And my whole life is dedicated to discovering the laws upon which this universe runs. And those laws are God independent. In other words, God, God doesn't come in as a, as a content of the laws. God, there's no, there's no creation problem. Being atheistic, there's no creation problem. So, for Moshe Rabbeinu, it was not in the realm of thinking. He couldn't have that thought. It never entered anybody's mind. The analogy to making was so powerful that that was a topic. Creation is a topic in medieval Jewish philosophy from the beginning to the end. But in the contemporary period, I say, wait a minute, what, what, what are you talking about? I remember many, many sessions with the Rav, my Rav, where I asked this type of a question, you know, and I never got good answers. Never got a good answer. Never got a, a, a clarification. But so be it. But that was the basic point. The basic point was Einstein here went for Spinoza because Einstein said, in effect, I don't have anything else. I don't believe in all of that. That's personal religion, that's Judaism. But Jewishness is this thing. Now, I say, just like Yerushalmi said about Freud, that psychoanalysis is Judaism redefined, reconceptualized with these points that I'm making. I say, I say the same exact thing about Einstein. In other words, even though I can't prove it, and Einstein probably never said it in words, like Freud perhaps never said it 
in words, and he can't prove it. There's not in the literature. The only emphasis is on the first part, on the negative part. But the, the, the positive part, that physics, relativity, is Judaism. And when you think about it, in effect, that's where I am. Because what I'm basically saying is that when you take these Jewishness dimensions and you feed them into Judaism, which is my concern, how do we keep Judaism alive? How do we, for Einstein, we can throw out the halachic system. For Spinoza, we throw out the halachic system. For me, I say, no, we've got to keep the halachic system. That's foolishness. That's foolishness to take a fantastic legal structure, which to me is one of the greatest contributions in Western civilization, namely the making of a, a Talmud, of a legal system, of the Mishnah and the Gemara, and the, the nomos embedded in a narrative, to use Carver's terms, a great legal system and to discard it on the basis of, a, of, of one premise about the God business, uh, that's crazy. Why not keep the basic structure and let's see if we can enliven it. It's not relevant, we'll make it relevant. We'll, we'll open up our minds and hearts to infuse what we're talking about as Jewishness into Judaism. And the purpose is the reconstruction, reconceptualization, shall we say, of Judaism. That's where I differ from Einstein and Spinoza and Yerushalmi. But up to that point, yeah, physics is no different than psychoanalysis. Indeed, it's a little lower on the scale because we're dealing with a life system. Where we are in Western science is we are struggling with the problem of how to make life into a scientific picture. We don't know what will be left over. But how do we get what, what I call the lyphonic physics? How do we get a, a science of life and what will it include and what will it exclude? It will not be complete. But it, being surprised, it may include the full range of psychological things from behaviorism up to psychoanalytic personality psychology. It will include all of this. So Freud, in a sense, is closer to the religion reconstructed, reconceptualized, because he's dealing with life. Einstein's dealing with gravitation, with energy, with a continuation of the original Newtonian physics of mechanics now is shifted into a much wider frame, but he's dealing with the non-life world, whereas Freud is dealing with the, non with the life world. So when Yerushalmi caught this point and says, you didn't want to say anything, you wouldn't, and he says, here, I'm not going to tell anybody. He's making this monologue with Freud to indicate this point. I thought that was a fantastic cop. A real Kiddush. I never saw it in anybody else. I never saw I read a lot of stuff. Remember, I wrote a book on Freud a number of years ago, and I read a, a number of significant books. I mean, some were big, <laughs> thick, to my, you know, 400 pages here, 400 pages here, and some I got in Xerox. But I did a lot of work on the Freud. I never came across anything like that. And when I came to you with Xiaomi, and I read this, his piece, I realized that it gave a chizuk, that I was on the right track. Because I, in effect, said at that time, before reading Yerushalmi, I ran, I said, Freud, without knowing it, backed into what I would call a rich, fantastic, rich Judaism. And indeed, to support it, it's not for now, but to support the idea is my view that if we will look in the Rambam, and we will look in the Agarita of the Gemara, the narrative in which the legal system is embedded, the mitzvot system, if we will look, come in with a set of questions and say, let's re-look at the material. Especially from one side in the Halakha and from the other side in the Agadah. Let's look at it 
from blank, as if we didn't have, we had a, like a big skipping of all the people that wrote. And let's look at it and search for these two dimensions, how they handled the God problem, and how did they affirm, would they affirm Yerushalmi's point about psychoanalysis and my parallel point about physics? How, how do they look at that? Let's take it as inquiry. Let's take it as a subject for inquiry and not presume that the answers have to be this way or that way. So I say we may be surprised to see that upon inquiry we will have uh, a different, a reconceptualized Judaism that will be relevant, absolutely 100% relevant for today. So this was the basic point. I also said in passing a number of times that when we deal with our great greatest of the great, the Rambam, yes, Spinoza centered on his theological premises, on Sefer Mada, the first book in the Mishnah Torah, and his Marnavuchim, the guide for the perplexed. But Spinoza did not enter into the rest of the Rambam, because I say, just like I said about Chazal, <coughs> if we enter Chazal, and with the set of questions, we may get some surprises to get some affirmations of this Jewishness, Jewishness music that I'm trying to infuse into Judaism. So I say the same thing will happen when we look at the Rambam. The Rambam cannot be reduced exclusively, primarily, to the, the theological underpinnings of the system. But I say that inside the halachic analysis, we may get some surprises that relate to this entry of Jewishness into Judaism. But I leave it open, and I tell the reader I'm leaving it open, but one shouldn't, one shouldn't be too fast to understand the Ramah. The Ramah is somebody who would say that you can't predicate existence of God. Wow. You can't do anything in positive predications. Well, implicit in that, there are dimensions of that working, when you work that out, it could be that we'll get some surprises to see that this approach that I'm talking about is compatible with the Rama. So I leave the Rama open because it, I think it's deserving of inquiry. On the last point on this particular thing, which we'll talk about some other time, is the point that I made about a godsend. That for our time, the characteristics, the halachic characteristics of the time we live in has changed since 1948. Since the beginning of the State of Israel, the Halachic status of time. Halacha, as you know, deals with everything that exists. It deals with people, it deals with events, it deals with inanimate things, it deals with animate things, it deals with beliefs, with feelings, with all, every. It's a comprehensive legal system that somebody who was in this liberal, egalitarian, Jewish mentality would say, wait a minute, I don't want to be told about everything, everything. I can't, there's nothing for me. Everything is talked about. Well, from one point of view, that's, that's, look, you know, you have to study and you have to bow, bow to the people who studied all this stuff and not think for yourself or think for yourself later. But, but for somebody else who says, wait a minute, for me, I'm looking for something else. I'm looking inside it, we're going to find exactly what you guys think is not there, namely this Jewishness. But we're going to find it in a sophisticated way, perhaps in the esoteric, it's not explicit, but it's in the basic orientation. So we can go two ways, depending on who, who's doing the talking and who much you're into. If you're saying, look, forget about all this, this is all irrelevant, how can you, how can me, the guy says to me, how can you be a Torah person in relation to mitzvot when there's no sovereign, there's no God giver? So I say, well, it's not quite the case. I mean, somebody could look at things as a gift, for example, without a giver. 
But for him, it doesn't necessarily mean that if there's a gift, there's a giver. One can look at his life, things, as a gift, but not from anybody in particular. So there are aspects of the picture which can feed into this reconceptualization of Judaism in terms of Jewishness. Okay, and so after Freud passed away, his daughter, who was a, a psychoanalyst, you know, she went to a meeting, blah, 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 blah. and one of the things she said was, uh, there was, she's talking about the derogatory comments against Freud's the acceptance of Freud material. Some of the time we'll talk about, he talked about Jewish psychoanalysis. There was Jewish psychoanalysis. And indeed, in Einstein, there was Jewish physics. And this was, uh, it's not now for tonight to make the analysis of how that came in. Uh, my sense is that in German, in Amsterdam, in, at the time in Germany, given the rise of the Nazi regime and the nationalism and everything else, at the time, there was German physics. There was a label of German physics, which was the carryover of the Newtonian physics into the new relativity picture. But this was young. It wasn't fully established, especially before 1918, when Eddington showed the bending of gravitational, bending of light rays and gravitational fields, and so on, so on. And there was this nationalism. I read in one book that even uh, Hitler, Joachim Schmo, was looked upon as the great scientist. The part of Nazi Germany was this this absolutism, this this uh, highest Aryan picture, and so Aryan physics was called German physics, and it was looked and it looked upon Einsteinian physics as disturbing, as upsetting the pinnacle, which was the pinnacle of physics, which, which was the Newtonian picture. So that for the Hamona, this was a whole uh, shift. So there's a whole picture of how this idea of Jewish physics came in, and I asked the question, I never found anything in the literature that where Einstein spoke about it. Maybe he didn't talk about it because it would have no efficacy, it would have no value, and it would only open up more material of people coming out of the woodwork and talking against the Einsteinian uh, physics as Jewish physics. But we, hear, we see a repeat of the same thing in Freud as we see in Einstein. So I say that's a separate historical picture to analyze where, I, I, I'm not going to read it tonight, I wrote a number of pages to analyze how that how I think that came about, and why Einstein never took the time to answer. Indeed, to end on this note for tonight, in the Einstein Jewishness, there was a component that I had left out over here, which was Zionism. Re Eretz Israel, Return of the Jewish People to Eretz Israel. Einstein in 1921, that's early, in 1921, Einstein joined the Zionist party, and he was there at that time, very disturbed by the growing anti-Semitism. And he makes a number of points in other places about how anti-Semitism does function to pull the people together, which is true. When you have this hatred of the Jew, you, there's something in the person that perks up and unites. And so in 1921, he was Zionist, primarily from the point of view of opposition to anti-Semitism, which has then and now still plays a role in the analysis and the causal picture of Jewishness, okay? But later on, in 1958, wherever the dates were, he was offered the presidency of the State of Israel. He never took out it, he never, he didn't accept it. And in his non-acceptance letter, he again reiterated that he looks at Zionism, he looks at Eretz Yisrael as his inner religious self. And he called it the new religion. 
he uses the word religious. He's taking a word that has this long history of back and forth between Judaism and Jewishness in terms of identity, and he, you see the music, you hear the music in the material, even though he didn't, like he said here, yeah, he can't prove it, but that's the music of Freud. And I'm suggesting that Einstein music took on the real activization of the Zionism of 1921 and 30 years later, 35 years later in 1958 or whatever it was, when he was offered the presidency of the state, he said in no uncertain terms, reaffirmed his Zionism and, and even talked about it in, in, in language that says, that's me. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am Jewish, but I have dimensions that are part of me, part of my Jewishness. Yours truly, me, is taking those dimensions and feeding them into a going in a different direction. Namely, how do we keep Hazal, which to me is the basis of Judaism, how do we keep it in the picture? How do we make it relevant? How do we, do we restore the life dimension? Somebody said, look, that's a pseudo problem. You'll never succeed. I don't know about that. Whether you will, or you won't. But the point is that this is a different direction. But it's built, being built explicitly on the analogy that I made here between the psychoanalysis being which means the world of the unconscious being part of a lifonic physics, dealing with life, and indeed the physics, we can't discard the universe. There's a non-life dimension of the universe. Or, shall we say, like I put it, when we will discover the life science, the science of the human life system, we will logically derive the unified field. Namely, how gravitation in relativity and particle physics unite and themselves are localizations of something higher. Just like relativity was a, uh, a perfection, a fine-tuning of Newtonian physics with respect to speeds close to the speed of light. Everything today in, is you know, building a bridge and everything is built on Newtonian physics. I mean, so, so just as Einstein refined Newtonian physics, I postulated, though I don't know how, that the Lyphonic physics will fine-tune and bring more unity to the scientific picture by logically, I called it logical derivation from the theoretical structure. Logical derivation of relativity and quantum from a life science, what I call the Einstein of biology. That's a speculation, but as of yet, nobody has finally shown that it's impossible. There's a lot of opposition to that. And the closest we've come is in thermodynamics, where Schrodinger wrote his book, What is Life? A small little thing, but in that book, he says that Thermodynamics is sufficient to understand the life system. I'm suggesting that when you take the full sweep of life activities, especially the unconscious, we will see that thermodynamics and neg entropy, which is the definition of the life system, is not sufficient. It will be included in the big picture, but it itself is not sufficient to understand the fullness of the life system. So what I tried to do this evening was to indicate, first, tentative definition of Judaism and Jewishness, and an exemplification of that in two, three people, and especially tonight limited to Freud and Einstein, to show the, the subtlety, the complexity, the richness, what I'm calling the music, that each person has a music. And that music in these two examples are beautiful uh, paradigm cases, shall we say, that one can learn a lot from 
for one's own self because oneself each person has the music the music changes shifts and as I said in the beginning one could easily define life as until the very end as a quest for finding out who you are in terms of personal identity some other time not for tonight we will talk more about how the performative utterance in terms of a person, a self-bestowed performative utterance which says, I'm Jewish. It's not an assertion, true or false. It's a declaration. I declare, I'm Jewish. And how does that, or I'm Israeli, or I'm American, how, does, how do these self-bestowed identity performatives function in a big picture? And how do they relate to the eventual goal here of the Lyphonic physics? We'll talk about that some other time, where it has its own topic about the performative utterance, which has, to me, given so much power by its entrance into a philosophical... So I even called it in the book here uh, a performative conception of reality. And I was, we're dealing with another entry into the philosophical, how the philosopher works and how the philosopher thinks, whereby relevance is built in right out of the way. If I am going to inquire about uh, the example I use was the proclamation, I was trying to interpret the proclamation, but it can apply to any anything in the past, any book. If I'm trying to interpret the thing and try to understand it, well, we were taught you. You go to the text, read the text, try to understand what the author meant. In this case, the conjoint author, author of the declaration here, and uh, what was the basic ideas and so on. Are they true? Are they not? How they fit? What the implications are and so on. Okay, so, well, who cares about Martha and George? I mean, that's the bridge. That's all. Who cares about George Washington? It's long gone forever. Luckily, we have a civics course where we discuss the first president was George Washington. We have a dollar bill with his picture on it. But who, who, who's, how is history relevant? It's all past and gone forever. Who, who cares? We're concerned with life, living in the pursuit of happiness today in the contemporary picture with all the difficulties and so on, so on, so on. And, uh, where's the relevance? So I'm saying, well, if you enter the picture of inquiry into the past with a truth orientation, you're dealing with history. Where's the relevance? Except for the person who teaches history and has to teach or has to prepare lectures for the university or whatever, or writing a book or something, for, these are a subgroup of very few people. I mean, most people, <laughs> that's not their work, so they don't have to do that. They can get by. Most people didn't read Freud, most people didn't read this, most people didn't do that. I had even people, friends of mine, educated. I mentioned Austin, for example, one of the guys, he said, never heard of him. Well, I say, how could you be educated? <laughs> well, yeah, educated for the philosopher, but or, or the intellectual Torah person, but not educated by Klau. I mean, one one doesn't need all of this. You don't have to have a big library. A big library, you know. In any event, this approach, which is this idea of the performative as a methodology, okay, brings with it relevance automatic. If we found out, if we caught the stream of consciousness of a person when he says, I'm Jewish, we may be in for some surprises, what comes in. In other words, there's a package of associations that go with the performative, the self-bestowed performative. And I ask the simple question, just as an aside for tonight, to end, I ask the question, Yerushalmi's contribution to history in his book was what he called historical memory. He said that we have to look at historical memory, memory of a 
history things and not just the what happened, not just the chronicle of what happened, of what the causes and effects were, the usual content, you know, traditional historiography of getting evidence and showing the thing, entering a truth approach. So I asked a simple question and it got me crazy and excited. So his Kiddush was historical memory. Where is that? What is historical memory? Historical memory is memory. In memory, everything is in the same plane. There's no past and future in memory. There's, everything is layers. And so what I discovered about the performative was, in effect, Yerushalmi's big Kiddush about history. That we don't need the traditional view of past, present, and future to do history. And indeed, in the culture of Moshe Rabbeinu time, when one asks the question, what is time? What is history? The answer is, there ain't none. Moshe Rabbeinu's time on the anthropological inquiry yields the conclusion their way of thinking was not our way of thinking in logic. The concept of time was in no way linear of past, present, and future. Everything existed on one plane and layers, what I call association package. So I developed all of this coming out of, out of Moshe Rabbeinu and life energy system. But lo and behold, it dovetails beautifully with the big Kiddush in history, the philosophy of history, that was put forth by Yerushalayim. Okay, tonight was just an attempt to share some ideas about Jewishness and Judaism that have somehow been bypassed in the literature. Okay, I want to talk tonight about Jewishness and Judaism. Okay, the first thing to understand is that these are big descriptive terms which cover beliefs, feelings, actions, attitudes, orientation, and so forth. So the first point is to realize that we're dealing with a very, very complex conglomeration of factors. But in order to do some kind of analysis, we have to get at least a minimal definition to begin with as a tentative thing. Later I'll come back to how we can improve the actual finding of what we're going to talk about, of what is this. Okay, Judaism. Judaism is a religion. We don't have to spell it out in detail. Any person who is giving, well, having a way of life that's built on the halacha, however it's understood, is in the domain of Judaism. So, it could be that the full array of factions of conservative, what used to be conservative, reform, and orthodox, are within the umbrella of Judaism, even though they have significant differences. Because, as you'll see when we talk about it, there are overlaps. These are not two definitions that don't overlap. There are overlaps on both aspects. Somebody can be committed to Judaism, the religion, but has overlaps that are coming from Jewishness, as we'll define it right away. And somebody can be Jewishness, exemplifying, and have overlaps that are coming in from the, from the religion per se. I mean, somebody could say, look, uh, I eat treif, but I observe the holidays. Now, we would say, well, well, how does that fit? Yeah, but there's so many variations in, in each piece, so we can then explore. Why is that? Oh, well, that has something to do with my childhood, because when I was childhood, I had a bubby, and I got, you know, a grand, and this was so, I loved the few food so much that it became part of me, and it, later I found it's kosher, and I, when I go out, I always eat kosher. But I don't keep the Shabbat, I don't do this, I don't do that. In other words, all of these are variations inside the definitions. 
So Judaism has something to do with at least following the inactions, following the halakha, having, uh, uh, if you're a miss, or if something passes you, that you do something wrong, it, you in, somehow internalize it as an avera, as a, as a sin. Not a wrongdoing, but a, a wrongdoing with a dimension of either reward and punishment, or that Hashem is looking, or whatever the point is. But there's a, uh, a package, and that's within the frame of Judaism. Now, Jewishness is something which comes without a prominence or an entry of any of these kinds of features that come in from Judaism, the religion. And for the moment, we leave God out of the picture. So I put in here, Judaism has a number of three or four salient characteristics. We don't have to talk about that. We're all in that framework. Jewishness has five general associations. There is being an independent thinker. The idea that one thinks for themselves and doesn't like any kind of authority, wherever it comes from, especially coming from the religion, one says, look, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do it for myself. Now, of course, sometimes you have to be told what to do first so that you can grow into doing it for yourself. However, there is this characteristic in the literature, and there is a big literature on Jewishness and Judaism because it relates to where we are and how we are <laughs> our, our lives. And this, and the continuation of Judaism or Jewishness, it, it, it's, it's a, big, a big, big topic. We're in this, what we're calling now Jewishness, we're pro-civil rights and pro-Negro and all the rest. Because this was underdog mentality, fighting for the underdog was significant as a feature of the, or a characteristic of Jewishness. Uh, four. There's a stubbornness, a tenacity, a strong will to survive against persecution. This had carried over from our recent experience in the 20th century, in the Shoah and so forth, but there is this, as, a, as we call it, a value, a certain kind of a, a strength, a certain concern with the, that, that one can overcome all of these difficulties that Jews and Jewish people have gone through. So it has... A, it emerges in the literature as, a, as a, one of the top, one of the uh, characteristics of Jewishness. The stubbornness, tenacity, strong will to survive against persecution. And five, there's an above average resentment and resistance to anti-Semitism. So that's very, it goes along with the previous one, that it's disturbing, but Anti-Semitism is a, uh, it somehow disturbs much, much more than somebody who is in Judaism and his life is wrapped up in the doing of the mitzvot, reading the, mater the traditional materials and so forth, and living his daily life is filled with things like that. We could check that out by the newspaper articles you read. We, as Torah people, what, what kind of things that you read? What kind of articles catch your eye and uh, are in the media? Or what kinds of programs you turn off on the TV or leave on when it comes to these kind of characteristics? So here we have basically five basic characteristics of what we're calling now Jewishness, Jewishness to get started with the analysis. And again, as I said before, there is overlap, but in general and for the purposes of our talk tonight, this differentiation is sufficient. But again, I stress that there is this overlap, which... Uh, okay, so one characteristic of Jewishness is being an independent thinker. Uh, Spinoza, for example, was an independent thinker, and he was lauded by people who were in this fold of Jewishness as distinct over against Judaism, Spinoza was a big hero. One of the reasons was because he was an independent thinker. And that's somehow a characteristic of 
Jewishness as distinct from Judaism. Which, of course, doesn't mean that you don't think even in Judaism. You think, but it has limits in terms of this, what you think, how you think, and having authority. So it's minimal, because nobody thinks without authority. So if you don't take Judaism as your authority, you're taking something else. You're taking secularism, you're taking liberal egalitarianism, you're taking something else. So it's not, again, I'm, I preface everything by indicating we're dealing with intimations, let's put it that way. Not sharply defined definitions, but just five characteristics of Jewishness that are in the literature, if, that if you read the general literature, you'll see it as a theme that repeats. One of it is this idea, being an independent thinker. Uh, having higher than average moral standards. Even today, it still, in the literature, indicates that people who have this sense of Jewishness, as distinct from Judaism, have themselves and look as a value <coughs> a higher than average moral set of standards. <coughs> okay, three, there are ranges of activity in favor of socio-political justice. That when it comes to society and societal things, there's an emphasis, a concern, an involvement, different levels of action, of activity, but a, certainly in a, a sensitivity more than the average person, a sensitivity to the socio-political issues and the justice of the time. As you know, in the uh, civil rights movement, for example, in the 60s in the States, many, many liberal Jews, who, uh, which makes it much, much more complicated and sets up a number of problems that we'll talk about. Fingerprints and forensics. Apparently, I never checked it out, there are no two prints that are the same. The world! You talk about the world! You talk about what, uh, 300 billion people or whatever the population is. Well, look, I mean, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable that there are no two fingerprints that are the same. Well, although I, working on a problem of Jewish identity, should be as simple as just saying, well, Give you soul, give you a soul print. I was gonna say, give you a soul print. You know, and here it is. We got it clean, and we can now go further and develop. Well, it's not like that. In other words, the closeness. Uh, you can have a, up to a certain point uh, the same rep repetitive pattern on the thumb, and then all of a sudden there's another another line, another layer, and that's a different person. So conceptually speaking. Because of this complexity and this overlap, the problem becomes, one of the big problems becomes, how do we ascertain the truth of these characteristics? How are they gleaned? When you read the literature, they were gleaned by sociology people, by people who are studying society. And in society, we have generalizations, which are fall into this category. Generalizations about family, generalizations about kinship, different, different topics. And these are done, but they're done with methodology, with a method, a methodology, question and answer, and so on, so on, so on, so on, observation. And so the complexity indicates to us that we really have very, very incomplete categories. Okay. Now, in the literature and in the history of Western civilization, there are, among others, three main exemplifications of Jewishness. One is Spinoza, 